Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. Hello. In this video, we're going to be working through an example of the 2D truss using the finite element method. So just to get a quick picture of what our truss is actually going to look like, we're going to have two elements with three nodes, and there will be a load on this outside node that we're going to call P. Let's number our nodes and our elements. In order to define it a little bit more, let's go ahead and give some values to the geometry of this problem. The distance in Y between nodes one and three is going to be three meters. And the distance in X is going to be four meters. And this will give us a nice three, four, five triangle to work with. We're gonna set this force P to 150 Newtons. And it'll be more convenient to talk about that in kilonewtons. So we'll go ahead and call that 0.15 kilonewtons. And then finally, we need to go ahead and provide the material properties and geometric properties of these truss elements themselves. And if you remember, the stiffness of a truss element is E A over L. For element one, we're gonna give that a value of 25 kilonewtons per meter. And then for element two, that's gonna be 20 kilonewtons per meter. Just using nice round numbers here to make the math a little bit easier. And as a reminder, let's go ahead and get our stiffness matrix for an element ready so that we can use that uh, for these two elements. So that stiffness matrix is a four by four and these C's and S's are cosines and sines. It's just a lot to write out if we try to write the full cosine theta, sine theta. With all of this setup, let's go ahead and look at our two elements in a little bit more detail. So element one was between nodes one and three, and we want to define the forces acting on those nodes in the global reference frame. So these will be in X's and Y's rather than size and eta's. So this is the force in the X direction on node one for element one, and then the same thing for Y. This is going to be the force in the x direction on node three for element one, and likewise for y. For element two, we have a nice clean horizontal element, and the forces here are gonna be the force in the x direction on node two for element two, and the same thing for y. And then the force in the x direction on node three, element two, and the same thing for y. Um, we need to build the stiffness matrices, and we're going to need the cosines and sines for those. We already have the EA and L for both elements, so now we just need to define the cosine and sine. Uh, the nice thing about a 3, 4, 5 triangle is that we don't have to do any trig in order to figure out cosine and sine. We know that cosine is the x component divided by the hypotenuse. And so the x component was four, we said, the hypotenuse was five, and so this is going to be 0 0.8. Likewise for the sine, the y component is going to be negative three, because we're starting at one and going to three, and the hypotenuse is still going to be five, and so this is a negative 0 0.6. For element two, everything is in the x direction, which means that our cosine is equal to one, and our sine is equal to zero, and we're done. Now let's go ahead and write out the stiffness matrix for element one. We can go ahead and write this EA over L just as 25 kilonewtons per meter. And then this is our four by four. And we can split this into four submatrices. The left-hand side is referring to node one. The right-hand side is referring to node three. This should be cosine times cosine. So this 0.8 squared, which is 0 0.64. Cosine times sine is going to be 0.8 times negative 0.6, so a negative 0 0.48. And then the sine times sine is going to be 0 0.36. And with those values in hand, we can go ahead and fill out the entire matrix. And then we'll do the same thing for element two. So the 20 kilonewtons per meter will come out front and this becomes very easy 
because everywhere we have a sine, we can just put a zero, and then one times one is just one. And so all these cosine times cosines are just gonna be one. And now with both of those in hand, we can finally go to assembly. We need a vector of six forces here. We're gonna organize these by node. So this will be node one, node two, node three. And then we're gonna go X and Y within each node. The force in the X direction for node one, we only have one of those and it comes from element one. And then the same thing for Y. For node two, again, we only have one element. And so this will be F X two, two, and F Y two, two. And then for node three, there are two elements attached to it. And so we're gonna have F x3 1 plus f x3 2 and then f y3 1 f y3 2. So this is summing up all of the internal forces acting on each of those nodes and that will be equal to a 6 by 6 stiffness matrix which will be multiplied by our vector of displacements. So for assembly we need to split up this element matrix into its component pieces. This is where these nodal values come in handy, just to remind us. This submatrix here is going to go in the 1, 1 position. 25 times 0.64 is equal to 16, times 0.48 is equal to negative 12, and then 0.36 multiplied by 25 gives us 9. We can do the same thing in the 1, 3, and the 3, 1 regions of our global matrix. So in the 1, 3 region, we are going to copy this piece down multiplied by 25. So that'll be negative 16, 12, 12, negative 9. And then down here, we're going to put this region. So this will be negative 16, 12, 12, negative 9. Now let's hold off on this 3, 3 region because we're also going to have some pieces from element 2. So element two exists between node two and node three, and this top left region is gonna go in the two, two zone. We can easily multiply 20 by one. We get 20, zero, zero, zero. This region will go in the two, three zone. So it's be negative 20, zero, zero, zero. And the same thing down here. Now, for this last piece, we need to account for both the submatrix here and the submatrix here because both of those are on the node 3. So the way this will work, we're going to have this 0.64 times 25, which is that 16. We're going to add that 1 to get 36. These are all zeros, so we don't have to worry about them for the other parts. So this will still be negative 12, negative 12, and 9. And we didn't have any contributions to either the 1, 2, or the 2, 1 region because we didn't have an element between node 1 and node 2. So the entire submatrix for those regions is 0. So this is the system of equations that we are trying to solve. The next thing we can do is go ahead and apply our boundary conditions. The displacement at node 1 and at node 2 is going to be 0 in both x and y because those are attached firmly to the wall. U1, V1, U2, and V2 all go to zero. The sum of the forces acting on three in the X direction is equal to zero because we have no external forces applied there. So we know that this is equal to zero. In the Y direction, we know that it's equal to negative 0.15. So this is our negative P. Now, these four forces are the reaction forces on the wall. So we can actually come back and grab these after we've calculated U3 and V3. So let's start off by calculating U3 and V3 from this set of matrices. Since all of these displacements are equal to zero, we can actually simplify this down to a much simpler set of equations that just includes this submatrix down here, this 36, negative 12, negative 12, 9, multiplied by U3 and V3. And that should be equal to the force vectors that we have over here, this 0 and negative P. This is relatively easy to solve, but I just plugged it into a matrix solver and got that U3 was equal to negative 0.01 meters and V3 was equal to negative 0.03 meters. 
And if we look at our problem again, we can double check to make sure that those answers make sense. If we're pushing down on node three here, we would expect our V3 to be negative. And then if we're applying a moment, then we'd expect this entire truss system to kind of bend this way, right? Because it has to twist based on that moment that we're applying uh, relative to, I guess, our wall over here. So that P is applying a moment, it's causing the entire truss to twist. And so that would bring our node three towards the left, which is in the negative X direction. So both of these values make sense in terms of sign and V3 is larger than U3, which also makes sense because we're actually applying that force in the Y direction. Now, we can take these values in order to calculate the reaction forces on the wall. If we wanted to see what effect the U3 and V3 have on FX11 and FY11, that would be multiplying by this matrix here. So we're gonna take that blue submatrix, multiply that by the known values of U3 and V3, and that will be equal to the FX11 and the FY11. Doing that quick math, we end up with a negative 0.2 kilonewtons for FX11. And in the Y direction, we get a positive 0.15 kilonewtons. And you'll notice that this FY11 is exactly the same value as this P that we've been given. But of course, this is in the positive Y direction. This is in the negative Y direction. And so this node one is supporting all of the force from that P. Let's go ahead and find the same thing for FX22 and FY22. And so for this one, we need to multiply it by this submatrix we're still using the same U3 and V3. And like I said, this will be Fx22 and Fy22. And this is a pretty easy matrix multiplication. We get a positive, so negative times negative, a positive 0 0.2 kilonewtons. And the force in the Y direction is simply equal to zero. If we look at these X forces, we see that they actually end up canceling out exactly. Uh, there's no net X force on this little truss, but what these are doing is they are counteracting the moment that this P force is applying. So that is it for today. This concludes our nice little 2D truss example. Thank you for listening, and I hope you found this helpful.